Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello all welcome to our course back to our course on precision oncology we last class we have discussed on the pro aspects of drug discovery in the precision oncology where we have gone in detail about the ma master protocols we went in details about the basket trials we went in uh, detail about the umbrella trials okay so basically what exactly how do this why is it so many drugs are required how are these dr drugs brought under the same umbrella of different arms of treatment all that we have been uh, totally went in detail in the last session so now here in this session we will really understand what exactly how can what is exactly the preclinical models used for precision oncology during the drug discovery so these preclinical models could be even in the cell culture model the patient derived explants patient derived organoids and the patient derived serographs for this session we are we will be talking in depth about the cell culture uh, what are a different cell lines used what are the advantages the disadvantages and the applications and we will just very lightly touch upon the patient derived explants and the patient derived xenografts here if we really understand this is a workflow for uh, drug discovery cancer is an epidemic disease causing approximately several million loss of uh, life every year around the world so there is an uh, absence of uh, a lot of uh, absence of understanding about the uh, complete cancer biology of each particular tumor so now we, and there and this is could be a key uh, hindrance to the uh, during the progress to for the, for the detection or for the uh, diagnosis or to uh, look for different clinical drugs so now we so for that particular uh, to this challenge initially scientists came up with a, a model called cell lines so now so why do we need these cell lines is because to test for the anti cancer drugs to test for the efficacy or the therapeutic properties of these particular anti cancer drugs we require the cell lines so they are created in the laboratory to display the key characteristics of the specific cell type while at the same time most of these cancer cell lines are immortal because and as a result they allow for the study of a specific cell type without the necessity of returning to the same donor repeatedly for example a hela cell line very well established cervical cancer cell line there are um, almost around several several thousands of uh, studies on this particular cell lines by uh, by almost all different cancer groups if you go across through many of the newbies labs for cancer biologies yes hela cell line is the starting material for in for the anti cancer drug discovery so this gives the pipeline for how a cancer uh, for the drug discovery so the basic discovery research where we have identified or any of the lead compounds then for that we have the preclinical development where exactly here the uh, cell culture the the patient derived xenografts or the xenografts will come and then the clinical trials which they are tested on the patients and further go on to your uh fda approval so that they can be launched in the uh into the market so this represents the systematic representation of the drug discovery process from a basic research which is identified which is taken care by the target identification and this will be translated into the market through the approvals of the fda so this good the good laboratory practices are completely required here for this particular staging so what exactly are cell lines cell lines are the laboratory models as i mentioned before and they are taken isolated from a uh, cancer individual from that particular tissue and from that particular tumor of origin and they have been propagated over the several years so there are several repositories to maintain cell lines such as your adccs which are very which maintain the state of the art facilities so that in order to facilitate researchers with the best cell lines possible 
in the sense that this the authenticity so for example the the good laboratory practices are all very well maintained so and this cell lines are the complete laboratory models and they are and it is very very important if one is working on cell lines to maintain a very good laboratory practices in terms of maintaining the sterility of the areas or in maintaining good protocols to ensure proper passaging and storage of this particular cell lines and most important importantly they should be maintained contamination free so that a particular drug tested is reported very well in very well in lines with the standard protocols so this is the progress and breakthrough of cell lines so if we can clearly see here from 1907 till 20, 2019 how the whole the cell line research has obtained breakthrough where here the in vitro cell cell culture experiments where they have started the first growth of the embryonic tissues of the pra, frog so that so it was uh, established in the beginning of the 20th century when the first discover work describing the culture of living tissues here it was reported by the harrison at the anatom anatomical department of the john hopkins university and at the 1911 the rockefeller institute for medical research in news uh, in news in new york had t burrows and axel uh, uh, alexis carrel where they had grown the in vitro culture of tumor der tissues derived from the chicken rogus sar sarcoma and from then onwards so they have been so this this particular cell uh, is a very much landmark here where the hela cell line that is the first human cancer cell line from the from the lady from a cervical ca cancer patient called henrietta lane was established in 1951 so and then as it was progressing the in the uh, cell line so they they have established that they have identified the mycoplasm which could be a key contaminant in the cell culture processes so i am then they have, there is an establishment of the cell line rgi draji and which is the first human hemopoietic cell line so which is done by the and this is a the draji is a burkitt human lymphoma cell line and it is the first human continuous hemopoietic cell line so although the draji cell line was successfully proven to be a model system that generated by uh, eb ebv virus infection so the cell line conditions definition was very very important to establish its grow growth and so that and this is very one first of the cell kind for the suspension culture so this is a very again another key important breakthrough or the landmark during the cell line research process in again here you have the 1970 the k562 which is derived from the as the the chronic myeloid lymphoma here 19 uh, so in the, and as this research was extensively going on and several groups were adding the cell, their own cell lines into the repository they have been identification of a cross contamination that is maybe sometimes a hela was not labeled as exactly hela <coughs> or misidentification of cell lines at the worldwide issue so this has become a very serious issue in the process in the process of drug discovery so in that time the national cancer institute which we will be dealing very very in detail in this uh, in this lecture was started that is the and they have established the nci anti cancer screening then the several and several in vitro model systems for studying the the acute pro promyelotic leukemia was established and there have been by identifications of many other guidelines and so on and till now we have a comprehensive data sets for regarding the genomic transcriptome and the proteomic profiles for each of this individual cell lines so this is very very important for this particular group for identify in the drug discovery to establish a cell line which is very very authenticated is very important so this nci screening service has been a active from 1990 and it covers several six, 60 different human cell lines to study the typical cancer models it is very important to have an intensive understanding of cancer biology in the recent era 
and if this particular understanding is totally impaired by impro by improper models it is a key hindrance to the research and development so it is important to have to understand the invasions to understand the metastasis and to inter understand the tumor micro environment of this particular disease so very briefly this slide shows the typical in vivo models uh, in vitro models as well as the in vivo models in the in vitro models the cell lines and the organ organites are very well established so in in this but the and whereas in the in vivo models you have the genetically or uh, engineered modified uh, organisms or the pdx models the zebra fresh and in the later stage the oncopix and some of them some of the study groups utilize drosophila so so this cell lines they have uh, they are the in vitro models they will be representing only the tumor micro environment uh, they may not be representative of the complete tumor per se so they will not be the cell lines they side they may have genomic Uh, alterations which are characteristic of the original tumor but they and because of several passages over the years they still do not represent the key original tumor characteristics of the original tumor and they could not be have any because they are the pure homogeneous cell lines they do not have any of the uh, cell cell interactions and they are very much prone to cross contaminations because in a lab we do not handle only one cell line when you use many multiple cell lines there is a chance possible a chance of cross contamination and it could be costly to culture but this uh, they can go for computational cancer models where these cell lines they can be taken up for the genome the transcriptome proteome and the metabolome analysis for identifying specific mutations linked to this particular drug response so this is a very key important use for uh, for application of using employing cell lines in the cancer discover drug discovery and this will allow this particular use of cell line models will allow for the identification of potential novel markers the driver and the passenger mutations and the driver therapeutic targets which they can be really taken up further as leads during the drug discovery program and when we use this pdx models or any of the other models they require an immuno deficient host so and they and sometimes the tumor if it's a very active tumor if it's a very invasive tumor it may not be able to establish in the pdx models so but so and technically they are challenging to perform is yes, a little bit of skill set you need to have a veterinarian to assist in the surgery for example any orthotopic models and they are expensive to model multiple mutations and the time contain consuming it's a time consuming work and specific skill set invasion method for drugs drug administration and drug absorbance and to study the end points also there is a lot of animal sacrifice required so these are the advancements in the cancer models which are currently being applied all over but however the tumors from all these particular models can be gone for further computational cancer analysis using any of these on of this four omics technologies cancer cell line is an in vitro tumor model that is recorded as a ubiquitous feature for cancer biology because it shows numerous intrinsic features of cancer and because it exhibits similar gene expression patterns a copy number alteration and a transcription cell profile of cancer cell lines it's quite similar to the origin of its tumor so cell lines are for most clinical ca cancer models due to they are very very critical because it's an ease to ease in handling they are much it is slightly relatively inexpensive then compared to the animal models they are immortal and they have, do not have remit uh, uh, so much cellular heterogeneity and there is a very fast high replicating rates so cancer cell lines how are they established they are established by isolating cancer cells from patient specific organs and then growing them in artificial culture media which on transplanting again in 
if this cell, uh, cell lines are put them back into the immunodeficient mice, they lead to the development of the cancer cell line graphs. Please note, this is different from a patient-derived xenografts, wherein the tumor per se from the patient is, is implanted into the mice. But here, the cell lines are injected in a particular number based on the weight of the mice to get into the mice models. A continuous growing cancer cell line is a very important resource for studying the mechanism of the antineoplastic drugs or anti-cancer therapeutics to study the mechanism of tumorigenesis and to study the and to study the mechanism of any other mechanistic pathways. So there are many many several cell lines developed, especially from the American type culture uh, collection. So cancer, uh, as I mentioned before, this is there is an NCI60 cancer cell line panel, the breast cancer panel and the colorectal cell family can panel. So the primary tumor mutations can be determined by the primary exome sequence. As important mentioned before, the HeLa was the first established from a 30 year uh, old woman, Henrietta Lacks by the American scientist George Ray. So this is a very important landmark as, as discussed in our previous slide. So what do we do with this cell lines? How do we, how do we make them relevant to the cancer drug discovery? So there's something what is called cell viability assays where the number of healthy cells upon treatment of a drug or a compound is estimated. So this measurement of this viability plays an important role in all forms of cell culture. Sometimes it is the very key purpose for determining a cytotoxic, uh, cytotoxic assays or it can be used to analyze the behavior of the number of cells for the number of cells upon given a, given a uh, stress condition. So cell based assays are often used for screening of collection of compounds as we have seen here. It may test, it is used to determine if the test molecules have effect on cell proliferation or show direct cytotoxic toxic effects that eventually lead to cell death. Cell based assays are widely used for measuring the receptor bindings and a variety of signal transduction events that may involve the expression of genetic reporters, trafficking of cellular components or monitoring organelle functions. So regardless of the types of cell based assays used, it is important to know how many viable cells are remaining at the end of a treatment of a particular drug. So there are many varieties of viability assays as we have shown. So we have the difficult importantly the tripen blue stain assay, the Yoson the Congo red assays and where you can measure. So this is a very important very key basic experiment in cell biology where the dead cells take up the tripen blue and the live cells do not take up the tripen blue. And again, a very important an ELISA based method, a colorimetric based method where we have the MTT, MTAs and all this particular assays. So this particular MTT assay is nothing but it is based on the reduction of the MTT to formazine and thereby the formazine is solubilized by DMSO. So the more the MTT reduction happens, the more the cell viability is cell viable cells are present. We have again another fluorometric cells and then the luminometric assays for determining the viability assays. Even a flow cytometric analysis such as the membrane permeabilities such as your NX and V binding assays, they are very very important to determine the viabilities of cells. So this is a very classic example of how a cell, a cell line can be mislabeled or it could be contaminated. Here in this particular experiment that they have discovered that the HeLa cell line which is derived from a female patient has expressed a Y chromosome marker. So this cell line authentication is a very very major concern in this cancer biology research labs. Mislabeling, replacement of cell lines derived from different uh, tissues, species and individuals and their contamination with other cell lines is a serious quality control issue which is faced by several of the cancer research groups. For example, the EC, e, ECV 304 is claimed to be transformed, uh, spontaneously transformed from human normal endothelial cell line, but it shows that it is a T24 bladder cancer cell. 
So cross contamination, mislabeling of cell culture vessels during routine manipulation, and cell line. It's a very common procedure which happens many with many of the researchers. So therefore, a cell line verification by short tandem repeat profiling is very very important, and this has been assured by many of the top lab rep cell line repositories to maintain to give the STR profiling upon the delivery of the drugs. A delivery of the cell lines to the particular lab. So, National Cancer Institute team has come up with an, a screen, a, a screen NCI 60 screen, which is led by this three particular important scientists. And since its early introduction in the 1990s, the National NCI panel of 60 cell lines have been used to screen more greater than. 1 lakhs cancer compounds and greater than 50,000 natural compounds the pro or their extracts for inhibition of uh, of tumor cell line growth profile and the uh, and the and thereby facilitating going for the FDA approval for this particular cancer drugs. The NCI, this particular, it's nothing to doubt, this, uh, this particular NCI 60 cell line has been extensively molecularly characterized by, by the exome sequence, DNA methylation, mRNA, the microRNA expression, protein and studies. The compound data profiling, the compound profiling data and the molecular characterization of the cell lines, they are all publicly available and they can be downloaded and from this particular uh, data website. So this has served the global cancer community for greater than 20 years and this was in, it was completely operational from 1900s and, and, this, and it serves to for the discovery of anti-cancer drugs. So this use, utilizes 60 different human tumor cell lines which represents these cell lines represent the leukemia, melanoma, the lung, colon, brain, breast and the kidney cancers. So this screen is unique in that the complexity of a 60 cell lines. This diagram represents the major the development, implementation and use of this NCI60 cell lines. So this work was proceeded through three phases such as the model development, operation as a primary drug screen and operation as a key utility of the cell line screens. And this work as I mentioned before was initiated by Paul and his team. So there have been several algorithms for comparing results across multiple compounds. Their algorithms, whatever they have identified, they allowed the system to tell or to inform that a compound was unique in its profile of cell killing or cytotoxicity or it could even suggest a mechanism of action or uh, it did not share a mechanism of resistance with the establishment re reagents. The molecular basis for these three distinctive patterns was not first initially elucidated, but the initial linking of the powerful insights ca came from the compare and that em and the other tools which emerged from the laboratory that MDR sensitive and uh, one sensitive compound displayed a common sensitivity pattern that depended upon the presence or absence of the important drug resistant transporter and the what in this particular cell lines. So the different milestones are given here. So this is a workflow for NCI 60 screening and second resisting. So compound suppliers, they are required to provide information about the biological, rational and chemical structure of the compounds that are to be examined and duplicates of the previous compounds or representatives of well, well uh, studied chemical classes. If there are complete only analogs, they are all completely re rejected. So this accessed compounds are sent to the central repository and then to testing. They either in the pre-screen model or directly to the US National Cancer Institute 60 anti-cancer that is called the NCI 60 anti-cancer drug screen. The results are then examined thoroughly by the team of uh, scientists and the compounds that show a pattern of interest are then are again sent for rescreening or retesting. The biological evaluation then, contest, then evaluates this particular screening with reference to the chemical or structures of the compound or any other available literature from the, comp from the existing uh, information. 
compounds that have rep uh, have reproducible patterns of interest usually and and those with relatively unique and those which do not so they are called they are the compare negative are initially tested in the in vivo hollow fiber uh, assays compounds than that are, are further taken down into further xenograft assays as, as well. So, this is the particular the testing of the drug of in, uh, interest involves the application of the 2D dimensional. So, please keep in mind this is a 2D tumor cell culture which are grown in monolayers. Testing is carried out on three cell lines that are frequently and the most sensitive, for example, the MCF7, the NCIH460, and the SF268. So, and this is the, the cytotoxicity of the test substance is determined is using the pink anionic dye sulforodamine. So, if the test substance inhibits the growth of at least one cell, cell line, testing proceeds to the next stage comprising. So, this or for the full 60 cell line panel. So, this gives a complete uh, idea of how the whole the drug development group works and how the complete uh, how this NCI serves to use cell lines as a preclinical model during anti-cancer drug discovery. So, this is a systematic overview of the information intensive approach of the cancer pharmacogenomics and the pharmacoproteomics based on the uh, NCI60 cancer cell lines. Each row of the activity here A database represents the pattern of activity. Database A it represents the pattern of a particular compound across the 60 cell lines. The database can be mapped into a structure S database containing a 2D or a 3D chemical structure descriptors. So, for example, any of the methyl or any of the position in the functional groups or any of the difference in the core structures they of the compound and the target T database here and the tar target T database containing molecular profile information of the cells is completely seen here Contain on the cells. The T database consists of data on the individual molecules, the omics data on the DNA, mRNA, protein and functional levels. The bioinformatic challenge is to, un is to understand and analyze this independent study of, of uh, this independent database separately and then to integrate each one of these uh, uh, data sets, the information from this data uh, sets to the uh, to the activity relationships of that particular given drug and with the public information for any of this pharmacogenomic purposes. So, this is how the inventory of 50 percent, if there are around 50,000 compounds, 60,000 uh, will less than 1 lakh will come to a 60 cell line screen and they will go for, for some of them will go for animal studies and further for their toxicity studies and the clinical studies. So, here we can clearly see that how even though there are so many of this particular NCI60 has several cell lines. So, but there are some molecular targets for the specific tumor type with this particular cell lines does not uh, address which way or not. So, some of this target agencies, yes, this, uh, the status of this target agent in this particular cell lines there, whereas so for all this particular important mutations, the important proto-oncogenes still they are in development and there are many some targets which the, there is no, that this particular target, it is only for the NCI targets, the cell line targets, only the KRAS and the PI3K, they are the cell lines, the mutation status is known. So, this cell line are not very much sufficient for an hemo heterogeneous tumor such as a lung cancer. So, what are the different cell culture applications? So, we call this animal cell culture or, or the cell culture or the animal tissue culture. In current drug discovery programs, it is very mandatory to select cell lines that have been genomically sequenced and they are biologically characterized in terms of identification of the driver mutations or the resistant mutations so that we know that this particular screen or this cell line will provide an F, uh, important tool. It will serve as a tool for a good drug dis 
the design or development program which which many scientists are employing for example the brelaf in inhibitor that is the vemurafenib which is very effective against the particular mutation that is your v600e mutation in melanoma and lung but it is not it doesn't it is not it is ineffective in the same mut uh, mutation in colon tumors thus in your target specific screening it is important to characterize the cellular context for example where exactly which particular tissue for example in this case the colon or the lung or the thyroid so several separate screening methods against this v36 600e mutant in the colon tumors are now again going again and they have identified uh, overexpressed egfr or is also an important accessory pathway of tumor proliferation in colorectal cancers leading to clinical trials of braf inhibitors in combination with an anti egfr antibody so for example the drug resistant subsets or the drug resistant tumors they there is a need for the drug resistant cell lines as targets for discovery of the second or the third generation inhibitors for example your tki inhibitors current screening approaches may appro in a, uh, may have incorporate over 1000 cell lines and more than 100 varieties of a single histological type of a tumor so with the ad advent of the dna technology molecular manipulations of has led to the development of a uh, several cell lines which are, which can be used as important during the important leads during the drug discovery process so this particular diagram gives an application of the cell culture in various uh, technologies are relevance is here with the drug discovery so we have seen if we have a novel compound that can be identified as a lead compound so it there should be a lead target in the cell line model so can we characterize this particular lead targets may be the protein essentially or a key enzyme or a kinase and they can be tar targeted uh, they can be really targeted or the mechanistic pathways can be used elucidated using this drug discovery programs in cell lines yes they they are good disease models and toxicity studies before the drug is characterized or given to any other animal model they have to prove that they are less toxic in a normal human cell lines models and again the drugs uh, testing the personalized therapy yes if we can take up this particular cells maybe the patient derived cell lines cells and they can you can identify the given the same anti cancer treatment on this particular the same this particular cell line of the patient x yes we have a personalized therapy therapeutics being developed and no wonder cell lines are also finding very good applications in this food food test and nutraceuticals and in regenerative medicine what are the advantages of using this animal cell culture yes the role of even effect of ph yes the temperatures o2 co2 concentrations and can be altered to start to study their effects on the cell culture metabolism to study cell metabolism and investigate the physiology and biochemistry of cells they can be really well employed as i mentioned cytotoxic assays can be very well studied it the effect of drug various drugs on the growth growth patterns of the different cell lines and these cell lines are very very important because they are homogeneous structures then you be a uh, 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 researcher need not be worried if this the study can be replicated or not and they provide valuable biological data from a large scale cell cultures specific proteins can be synthesized from a large genetically modified cells however they are expensive exp and uh, and there is a, and it is a very a skill set technique that requires complete aesthetic aseptic conditions there is required need for trained personnel and the cost of treatment a cell characteristics de differentiation can change after a period of continuous growth in cultures so which could be leading to entirely different properties from the origin of the host and there is a low amount of product maybe whatever the the monoclonal antibody or the recombinant protein produced followed by downstream processes they are all very low 
very very the cell lines are prone to micro micro contamination by other mycoplasm and the viral infections and they can be uh, and they can be detected and they are highly contagious so we have seen how the 2d monolayer structures have cell lines are very very important for drug discovery programs after and and we have seen what are the advantages and what are the disadvantages yes they cannot be mimicking a typical tumor environment so in uh, this are all the it is very very important to incorporate a very important tumor micro environments during the drug discovery programs so you need to have a non uniform exposure which is it is not suppose in imagine a 2d layer where the use the exposure to the oxygen and nutrients is very well same for every cell, for every cell whereas in the typical in the in vivo situation there is non uniform exposure and there is non uniform exposure to drugs and compounds in a 2d layer in a two dimension each cell will receive the same amount of drug whereas in a regular in an in vivo situation yes there is no non uniform signature here and there is paracrine signal here if we can notice it is not a single cell which is there we have a different so it a um, tumor micro environment combined by stromal cells then then there is a there is a comparison of activated macrophages the malignant epithelial cells all of them will try to give a paracrine signals the cancer cells will give uh, which will help this particular epithelial cells to secrete factors which will in turn grow uh, allow for the growth of the uh, cancer cells and then there is a lot of cell to cell interactions and there is a, there is an a gradation that is maybe for example if oxygen is there if we can really see for oxygen it is the expo the, there is a region of hypoxia in the center but there is a region of high oxygen density in the periphery so but how does it how do we incorporate such elements into the tumor micro in the drug discovery program to further that the many in vitro models have come up where a two dimensional structures and then a microfluidic uh, structures so based on this is a mono layer of cells and then they had come up with a in vitro model that is like a mixed culture so can they have two cell lines of layers of cell or and using a boyden chamber in insert where a pet porous so there is a two different cell lines here a non migrating cell line is kept on the top layer and the migrating cell line is is seeded on the lower layer and as such but this cell these the contact is maintained by the exchange of fluids between both and a three dimensional layer uh, culture which is very very important that is you do here if we can clearly see the cells are forming a mono layer but here the cells are clustered to form what is called multicellular spheroids and then you have the mixed cell cultures or your mixed cell culture cellular organoids and then this spheroids can be done even by a hanging drop and then we have the different cells which are which can be which form a tumor micro environment they can be placed for during the by for the my in a microfluidic device and different devices here and so a tumor stroma with model based on the co cultivation of several cells on an extra cellular matrix model is completely it's an organoid based model this scheme of microfluidic system here if it evaluates the invasive potential of tumor cells which are the different types of in vitro tumor models are generated so as we have clearly seen the monoculture it's a single type and here we can have a mixed culture that is and where there is a different and a boyden in chamber insert which are where the two style different cell types are separated by an culture insert and they are there is a um, exchange of nutrients because they all share the same medium over here so the non migrating cells are placed on the top and the migrating cells are placed in the below and there is a different three dimensional cell culture through the formation of multicellular spheroids if we can see and the mixed cell culture then uh, they, we have been using schemes of uh, microfluidic uh, devices to develop a tumor micro environment where channel with cells and hydrogels are given here for the uh, is placed in the central channel and this 
So based on the purpose of this experiment, these channels are put with different kinds of medium. And here again the tumor bioprinting models where a tumor model which is a, which is layered along with the layers of stromal cells as you can see here. Bioprinted spheroids are also there, are also present consisting of tumor cells and bioprinted spheroids which are the models of the tumor models, the tumor stroma consist of the tumor cells with the stromal cells and then finally a glioma model conventioning consisting of a 3D printed brain which is very very happening in much. There are several 3D printed organs which they are coming with bioprinted glioma model and the glioma cells and the macrophages are seen here. So, these are all the models which are very very actively explored during drug discovery in the cell in the cell line models. As I have mentioned what is a 3D model? We know that in a single 2D model the cells are present as a single monolayer and here the cell seeding is in a linear pattern and the cells grow in a linear way and they can grow in a single linear way. Whereas, if we add a z dimension to the seeding, the cell growth and where the cells are not allowed to adhere into their surface and the cell growth where they tend to aggregate, so cancer cells and then they, they will form a complete 3D structure. So, the spheroid models are very well actively proven to be physiologically relevant than the 2D cultures because they emulate the, the key features of the solid tumors. For instance, the growth kinetics of spheroids is similar to the real tumor where the outer layer here we can see here where the uh, outer layer of proliferating cells surrounds the layer of non-proliferating cells that is the cusin cells or the dead cells and as a result there is a necrotic layer in the middle and that gives an hypoxic condition or the region of low oxygen in the center. Those cells are loosely attached to each other whereas in the intermediate layer cells packing the ECM are denser. As a consequence an oxygen density gradient is there due to impaired oxygen function which is one of the causes of the necrosis in the central region of your spheroid. So, this is the main difference as I was explaining before. So, 3D models have jo shown a great potential. So, there is an uh, hypoxic roar and there is a loosely dense of proliferating and a layer of cells around and different exposure to drug uh, uh, to drug molecules. So, we cannot be treating the same drug concentration as we do for a 2D culture where we can see that there is a uniform exposure to drug. So, this represents this 3D model that is representative of a typical tumor, tumor in the real scenario. So, there is a wide characterization of an extensive range of cancer cell lines has offered the researchers for the possibility of developing 3D cell lines. Almost all cancer cell lines can be grown into 3D cultures and, and they have been this into 3D cultures or 3D spheroids and they have been exhibit tumor tissue like biological features and when coupled when there is in a co-culture with the stromal or immune, immune uh, yeah, other immune cells, they recapitulate the in vivo micro environment provi providing to be very very much more biological relevant than the 2D counterparts. So, this, this gives a scheme for the, there are different methods for preparation of multicellular tumor spheroids or the 3D spheroids. So, we have the hanging drop method, there is an overlay method, lipid overlay method and there are spinner flask and the magnetic cultures. For in all these methods, we can clearly see how the hanging, how this particular, the cells are coming together at the bottom of a hanging drop or where the surface of the plates or wherever here the cells are coming up in the liquid overlay method where we can clearly see the accumulation of, of the cells here because of a non-adhering coat, uh, adhesive coating to the surface and then and this uh, this particular spheroids they have a typical physiology as mentioned before they, they, they defects the uh, distribution of proliferating so this orange cells are distributed in the outside layer the violet are the quiescent the middle layer and the necrotic cells at the the violet is here and these are the necrotic cells purple at the clue. So, the cell density is lower in the outside layer. So, this is how a typical and this typically represents the 
tumor microenvironment and the spheroids could be so we have further stepped up now from the cell lines to the spheroids or the mcts so that uh, we can imitate a tumor microenvironment to some extent as very well with the 2d model yes the 3d organoid culture models they are very well applied for tumor cell to understand the tumor cell metabolism and the signaling pathway and then uh, to understand the invasion and metastasis of tumor cells for the drug delivery system evaluation yes can the drug can it penetrate and then it's easy to section this particular model and then anti-tumor drug screening very very important what are the various approaches used for cell 3d cell culturing so we have the hydrogels where the cells are mixed with a hydrogel matrix when and then using a cross cross linger and then we have the 3D bioprints to maintain the scaffolds for requiring the 3D spheroids. And then, then there is something called the microfluidic chips for maintaining the uh, 3D spheroids. So this is a all important approach used for 3D cell culture. Ring. And given the different comparisons, as have been mentioned, this table mentions the different uh, advantages and disadvantages of each 2D or the 3D have over each other. They, the 2D cultures have a very less uh, physiological relevance, but because of the hypoxic region, the 3D cultures have a better physiological re relevance. And in, in a 2D culture, the culture formation, the cultures are established within few minutes or immediately a few hours after the seeding. Whereas it may take few days for the spheroids to form and it is a challenge to maintain spheroids without much disrupting. So careful technicians, careful methodologies have to be em employed not to see the disturbance of the spheroids during the treatment of the drugs. They do high, they, the 2D cultures have high performance, the simple to culture and easy to interpret. There could be variations in the two, 3D cultures because of complexity of cultures and difficult. So maybe uh, in the, if the same conditions are reproduced every time, it is still the challenge to reproduce the 3D culture drug treatment. They, the 2D cultures do not mimic tissue environment, but here there, there is a in vivo condition are uh, replicated. There is no cell, no cell, cell or no cell, uh, cell extracellular environments in the 2D culture, and there is altered morphological characteristics and cell, uh, cell division process. Thus, there is loss of pol polarity and phenotype. Here, some kind of cell division process, the morphological characteristics and uh, diversity, polarity, phenotypic characteristics are retained here. So, there is a lot of changes in mRNA, um, gene splicing, gene rep expression and cellular biochemistry. Whereas, they could be all these particular characteristics are representative of the in vitro, in vitro environment. All homogeneous distribution as mentioned before and unlimited uh, access uh, because of forming a spheroid, the distribution of the drugs or to the access to the nutrients is not as uniform as before. A good poor drug metabolism, it could be a drug. There is, it's not, it could be the, the 3D cultures are much more expensive and there could be a specialized skill set. The reproducing a 2D uh, a drug IC50 in 2D cultures is easy, whereas in 3D cultures it is a real challenge. So one more important human tumor histoculture culture studies and they were pioneered by Robert Hoffman at all and they involved the generation of tissue slices from tumor which are obtained from surgical resection and they were then cultured for extended periods of time using specialized collagen cells. So this ensured that this particular uh, tissues they have retained the stoma, proper stomal component within the TME along with the cancer cells and this whole thing is retained and it is found to, found to maintain properties of their in vivo state including the space spatial organization and differentiation cell function and the growth of multiple cell types within a single cell was observed. So culture of, as mentioned here there is this histoculture drug response sensitivity was done here 
where the development for assessing the chemotherapy response. So, for example, you have a patient cell, cell uh, uh, tissue, uh, tissue uh, the same drug that is being administered to the patient can also be given to your, uh, to this particular histoculture or the patient derived explants and then we can monitor the PD biomarkers in the explant and then there is an Okay, there is an MTTSA for as an endpoint analysis and then here which we commonly use even everywhere here is the gelatin uh, sponges to support this explant culture. It is just as nothing but the dental sponges where they are inserted in the medium of choice and along with the supplements or the medium requirements the, the tissues are implanted here. So, then after few or days of allowing the explants to establish, they are treated with the drugs. So, here this particular group has used to test targeted therapeutics, yes, and then the PDE correlation with the patient outcomes can also be analyzed here. This is an available preclinical cancer models as mentioned in the first of slide of my talk where the, there are some models where only the endothelial cells, the cancer associated fibroplasts, the immune cells, the tumor cells, they are all represented in each of these preclinical models. So, for example, the mouse model will try to maintain all the all this but along with the cancer associated fibroplasts and then the explants also will have most of these particular cells and along with the tumor cells. The organoids or the cell lines would be only with the tumor specific and in all this particular cell line, so these two the organoids and the cell lines are uh, and the, uh, they are the in vitro models whereas the explants, uh, of course the explants are also the in vitro models but the there is the some of them are the ex vivo and the mouse models are the in vivo models and very interestingly there are mouse models taking the circulating tumor cells as well. So, this in vitro and the in vivo approaches generally involve deconstruction of the original tissue tumors and in some cases this original tumors are reconstructed for subsequent assessment of your drug response through the uh, so, although the PDX models are the whole motive, they can preserve the integrity of original tumors following immediate transfer. So, the explants, uh, ex vivo approaches such as the patient divided explant models, they assess that the drug directly in tumor samples obtained from surgery without a de deconstruction or a reconstruction. So, the tissue per se, the original tissue, of course, if it is has to be histologically characterized or the molecular signatures for that tumor have to be obtained. So, this particular scheme shows the cell types available for derivation and, and, and use in each model model system. So, this represents the three clinical models here again where we have the patient derived xenografts. For example, the tumor from a lung or from the prostate or from the breast is implanted into the mice for the first generation xenografts and once this is established, the tree, they are treated with the same drug as the patient goes through. So, they can be used as the tumor avatars, the mice models and then after further expansions into your F0, F1 and the F2 generations, the efficacy of the drug will be measured by the decrease in size of the tumor. So, the tumor volume. So, upon treatment and how the vehicle control with in the absence of a drug, how the tumor volume increases and upon treatment, how the tumor volume decreases is clearly shown here. Similarly, in the organoids or with the single cancer cells that is your patient derived cells. So, this particular effect of this drugs can be very well studied. So, here there is this is this gives a typical uh, model of the patient derived orga, or organoid model where the scientists from the 20th century as I mentioned before, they studied began to try the 3D culture of cancer cells and then but 3D culture was not fully representative or widely to because of this or recognized or widely applied because of this technical constraints as I mentioned before. So, they, were, they have shown that it is the patient derived tumor tissue is firstly digested into single cells and transplanted into a basement membrane exactly with the growth cells. Uh, that, 
and could be reorganized successfully in several weeks. So, the idea of the organized cultural has been uh, very well established for several meetings of time and several important publications was have come in picture. So, patient derived organisms had they have the advantages on uh, gene editing, immunology research and high throughput then PDX. It is and it can be having a lot of high throughput because it is only a 1 mm dish or 1 mm, uh, 1 mm culture or uh, tumor tissue is enough for the organites to be to be established. So, towards the end of 20th century many scientists have started from the 3D culture and they are very well progressing towards organites and which are very very important for in their drug discovery processes because of they represent the whole tumor. Patient derived organoids as mentioned before they show structural features with the primary tumor of origin. They are such as the expression patterns, the clono the copy number abrasions, the transcriptome landscape and the mutation status of the tumor is completely retained in this particular patient derived organoids or the explants. So, after the surgically resected tissue it is cut into four pieces and then the original tissue along with this explant there is a confirmation of similarity between uh, has to be done between the tissue and the explant. So, which is done by a histology or the HE, um, the HED or the head to staining and by sequencing copy number alterations and mutations in screening. After that the drug screening is then performed on the explants of the organites to check for the effectiveness of the drug or to check if the patient will definitely respond to that particular drug. Here we have to first keep in mind the drug is directly being given treated onto the tumor whereas in the real scenario the drugs are ad administered intravenously and and there is another passage route for the for the tumor to be accessed by the drug. So, a drug screening is then performed to see the results can then assist for the clinician for what treatment can to be used for the patient. So, there are different methods the development of organ organoids as an ex vivo model system has revolutionized the primary and clinical cancer studies during the last decades. The PDEs or the organoids are infinitesimal of they are representative of human organs and tissues and functional features and structures of the selected organisms are very well retained or represented. So, the uh, pa pa patient derived organoid cancer model is, devlo is developed by tumor cells isolated from the tissue of cancer patient in and and there is the complete extracellular matrix of the specific culture media which can develop into a cancer organoids. So, organoids are also amendable for further molecular cellular characterization and by manipulation of several genetic tools and that can help in causing uh, for the approach or identifying the causative approaches for cancer in uh, etiology. So, now we have just introduced the term patient derived xenografts where we are using either immunodeficient mouse models for establishing the tumors from the directly from the patient. So, this per mouse models immunodeficient mice models uh, will harbor the tumors they will they and the drugs can be tested on this particular mice. So, in 1969 Riegerd and Powelson successfully transplanted the human colonodinic tumor tissue into nude mice. They have done it in U University of Com uh, Copenhagen and they have established the first PDX. But however, till 1990 because of the uh, NCI 60 as I mentioned before, they did not promote the, they did not promote the use of mouse models because of the uh, of because of harming of ha uh, injury to the animals or to minimize the usage of, uh, of uh, animals. So, NCS 60 because of it was so widely employed and widespread its applications were all over. So, they could this the PDX models were not coming up into line. So, but however, NOD skid mice was first developed to establish the PDX model in John Hopkins University which greatly promoted the 
development of pdx so so this was the first pdx model so again the pdx model gained popularity at 2006 during 2006 at the beginning of 21st century where there are many many increasing number of institutes especially the pharmaceutical companies prefer to choose the pdx models in all their pharmacodynamic studies in 2015 Uh, 14 the pdx was used in the science model was shown in the science uh, journal model to uh, human body so it was the, it was elected as a cover to cover and this is when the high, uh, nci overhauled the nci 60 this 60 cell lines in 2016 so and uh, so they they have declared that this particular cell line models will be retired in this particular year so the may uh, so now of all many of the pharma companies many of all the research labs and the research institutes are racing towards to develop a pdx models and only this is the perfect model for evaluation of the uh, anti cancer drug treatment patient this mice models are very very key, key important models because they represent the whole tumor and the uh, the toxicity or the effect of this particular anti cancer drug on the particular mice with that particular tumor type is very very personalized or it's very very patient specific so a patient may be harboring any particular mutation and uh, for uh, for example and this particular drug does not respond to that or the and the tumor does not respond to that particular drug yes this patient may not be taking up this drug and the patient the, the drug treatment or the th- targeted therapy can be such a competent for that particular patient so as to avoid unnecessary administration of drugs here this is the patient derived models in cancer research as as mentioned they have been for very very uh, fundamental for uh, use of novel uh, new targets and for the studying of the mechanistic properties and then pre experimental of all and all this particular clinical trials and in the clinical as i mentioned here personalized treatment yes a patient specific treatment models can be coming up for example for all the clinical trials especially in the car t trials this pdx models are very very important and this drugs can be evaluated for their cytotoxicity in all this pd and the pdx models and the mechanism the of pharmacodynamics can be well studied here so in this whole st- in this in this session we have come to the end where we have totally in depth detailed the applications of cell uh, cell culture during drug discovery in precision medicine so we have totally in depth detailed about the different examples of cell lines what are the different advantages and disadvantages of using cell culture and how can they be easily be manipulated mislabeled or they could have the cell lines models could have lost the original characteristics of the original tumor we have totally in detail seen the 3d culture we have seen how the 3d uh, 3d spheroids what are the different skep folds the hydrogels we have the microfluidics to establish 3d cultures and then we have totally in depth and uh, seen how the patient derived explants can be established and how they can be they are very much good avatars of the tumors and the same drug what has been administered to the patient can be tested on this patient derived explants and then we have seen the very well in brief very in brief about the patient patient derived xenograft models about the mouse models how the same tumor can be propagated in mice along with the administration of the inhibitors so this brings to the end of our session thank you